happy Sabbath, and welcome to the Old Westbury Seventh Adventist Church Sabbath School study time. We are thankful for you tuning in today, for those watching online, as well as our members and guests here locally. Thank you for being here with us today. I know we'll be uh, enjoying another exciting study. Uh, it's rest, relationship, and healing. Is, did I get it right? Rest, relationship, and healing. Yes. Continuing on with the story of Joseph and uh, his experience to help us in our experience today. For those watching online, if you do not have the Sabbath School material, you can go to our website. You can download it there. Uh, we do have a junior Zoom Sabbath School class that you can log into and watch. We also have primary and kindergarten that is open here at the church for our church members. Please be mindful at this time we're only able to do church members only. Creator Roll is not active at this time, and so please be mindful of that when you share with your friends and family. It's uh, for church members only at this time. But we are glad that you have chosen to be be here with us today. I know we'll have an exciting uh, time studying. So I'm going to invite you to bow your head as we pray together, and then we'll ask our, <clears throat> excuse me, ask our teacher, Elder Santiago, to come up and guide us today. Father in heaven, thank you for the Sabbath. Thank you for this time that we can get together and to open your word and to study about rest, relationships, and healing. Please bless as we look into the life of Joseph in that we can draw lessons to how we can apply these things to our life today. So we ask this in Jesus' precious name, amen. If you're watching online, please remember that you can ask for questions and comments, and then we try to share them as best we can. And also give a shout out, let us know you're watching online. I know that will encourage uh, uh, David as he leads too. So be sure and uh, put on there, happy Sabbath, let us know you're watching, and uh, post your questions, and we'll get to those as best we can. Uh, thank you, God bless. It's good to be here in the house of the Lord, studying from God's word. Um, surely there's going to be a blessing as we have been learning about rest in the Bible. And this week, as I was picking up from last week, from where we were talking about the, 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 the story of Joseph, uh, the story picks up with Joseph because Joseph, he takes up a large part of the book of Genesis and there's so much uh, profound doctrine and so much example that we could learn from Joseph. When we study the life of Joseph and we compare him to the life of Christ, Joseph, as we know, is one of the Bible characters that is a type of Christ because of the things that he endured, in fact, that he was betrayed by his brothers, sold into slavery, um, you know, mocked and scorned and treated uh, so horribly by his own brothers. And it's a, a story that when you look at if you're going to talk about the word forgiveness, that is a story that you will, you will use as a prime example of pure forgiveness. And that's what basically, we're talking about rest, relationships, and healing, but we're using that biblical example of rest, relationship, and healing. And we're talking about rest, we're talking about forgiveness. Now, not to plug myself, but I gave a sermon once on forgiveness. It's, it's still on, on um, live stream if you go back and watch it, and I found it... Um, you know, beneficial that, that I actually got to teach this lesson because, again, in my studying for the, for the, the biblical concept of forgiveness and what forgiveness is, and um, as back then I talked about forgiveness and what our definition, a human definition of forgiveness is, and what the definition, the biblical definition, and the two are almost polar opposites because we have this concept of what we think forgiveness is, and this lesson really drives it home and it's funny the way things work because as I was studying the lesson and I'm reviewing forgiveness a lot of the things I spoke about during my sermon are right in the lesson and it's no credit to me it's a credit to the Holy Spirit because he's the same spirit truth is truth no matter where you find it or when you find it that the Holy Spirit is consistent throughout and I, I just praise God for that because he revealed things to me back then that are even still in the lesson today and I think that's just that's just amazing with the way God works. So like as the pastor said, if you have comments, if you have questions, please let us know you're there. Let us know you're watching. Say hi. Say good morning. Say happy Sabbath. Um, you know, wish everyone a happy Sabbath. And we're happy that you're, you're tuning in. And again, and as I've mentioned before, don't let this pandemic thing bother you. You might be at home. You can still be a digital evangelist. Uh, they, they, they taught us this during, during our elder training, okay, just recently. A digital evangelist or a digital disciple 
you can actually still spread the gospel even if you're home, sick or shut in, or even if you're quarantined, whatever, you can still spread the gospel. It's as simple as logging into Facebook Live, liking a, a particular comment, posting something, sharing the Facebook Live feed, uh, going onto the, the web stream services, making comments, and again, sharing that with others because there are many other local churches that don't have Sabbath school right now. So we're okay. If you want to share the Sabbath school with those other churches, fine. We'll, we'll bring them on. We'll, uh, we'll take more students as they come along. And I, I welcome the more the merrier, as I always say. So share the Sabbath school. You just never know. And especially with this topic of forgiveness, you just never know who is going to get the message at the right time. And when we talk about forgiveness, it's something that we all need to be constantly reminded of because all of us, I don't care who you are, harbor some type of ill feeling towards someone who has hurt us. And it's, it's, it's something that it's very difficult to overcome, but it's only by the power and grace of God that we're able to do it. So it's lesson number seven, rest, relationships, and healing. Our memory text is taken from Genesis chapter 45, verse five, and it says, but now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. And we're gonna talk about that a little later when Joseph makes those statements to his brothers. And <clears throat> another topic that I had also preached on was God's providence. And you see Joseph here recognizing God's providence in his life. He saw that even though he was sold into slavery, even though he was falsely accused of adultery, even though he was thrown into prison, he saw God's hand throughout the whole thing. He knew all along, and it was probably not until he got exalted to the position that he was exalted to, that he realized that it was God's working in his life, that whatever bad things happen to them, God is able to work all things for good, right? And that's a prime example when we talk about the story of Joseph. So, rest, relationships, and healing. After the butler was released, so we're picking up on the story, right? We do know the story of Joseph, as in last week, as Dr. Mangela described, you know, the coat of many colors, that the dreamer decided to go to his brothers and, and to his father and say that the sun and the moon and the stars all bowed to him. And he was this young, you know, spoiled kid that was the favorite of his father, and the father made no bones about it. Why was Joseph uh, Jacob's favorite? What does the Bible say as to why he was the favorite? Uh, Dr. Mangela, uh, blue mic, please. Because he was the son of his beloved, Rachel, yes. mm -hmm. and he was born in his old age, so he, he was his favorite. Yeah, and, but Benjamin was also born of Rachel. In fact, Benjamin, some might argue, because Rachel died in childbirth bearing Benjamin, but yet he favored Joseph because Joseph was the firstborn of Rachel. And he was, as the Bible simply describes it as, he was the child of his old age. So Joseph favored, I mean, Jacob favored Joseph for that reason. And he, he made no bones about it. He, he showered his affection and his preference and his um, uh, affection towards Joseph. And this made the other brothers very jealous and very um, uh, hateful of Joseph. Now, how many other brothers did Joseph have? Eleven other brothers. Were they all from the same mother? How many different mothers? Four, right? Who were the other two besides Rachel and Leah? Bilhah, who was Rachel's uh, servant, right? That, and then Leah also had a, had a servant that Jacob also conceived two children with. So four, four, of the, four of those brothers were from two of the handmaids of Rachel and Leah. So we see that there's this half-brother situation, right? Half-brothers. And I don't know how you feel about if you have a half-brother or a half-sister. Do you consider them your full brother, your full sister, or do you just merely view them as a half-brother or half-sister? Do you look at them differently? Do you look at them, you know, and we're not even talking about stepbrothers and stepsisters. Now we're talking about half-brother, half-sister. But we see this relationship here, and it's, it's something that, uh, you know, we need to keep that in the back of our mind. So we look at this rest relationship. After the butt was released, okay, so Joseph is now falsely accused, as we picked up last week. He was falsely accused. He's thrown into prison. The butler, he was, he was interpreting dreams for the butler and the 
a baker who both were accused of poisoning Pharaoh. So Pharaoh didn't know who had poisoned him, but these were the two prime suspects, and they cast him into prison with Joseph. So uh, after a certain amount of time came, the truth that Joseph interpreted the dream for the butler and the baker, and he said it exactly how it was going to be. One was going to be restored to his position, and the other was going to be put to death. And just as Joseph had revealed it, because God revealed it to Joseph, the dreams fulfilled themselves. Now when the butler was, was his dream was interpreted, Joseph said to him, please remember me when you get restored into your position. But of course, soon after the butler forgot about Joseph, and Joseph spent another two years in prison waiting for the poor butler to remember Joseph in prison. After the two years when Pharaoh had these dreams, now all of a sudden the butler remembers, oh, there's a Hebrew in the prison that can interpret dreams. The butler remembered about Joseph when the Pharaoh had a couple of strange dreams. He told Pharaoh how Joseph had interpreted his dream and the bakers. Joseph did not claim he was the one interpreting dreams, but glorified God instead. It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. And that's the humility that we see with Joseph, the character that he possesses. Yes, Pastor. Yeah, so a comment came in here with the last topic you're on. They're family no matter what. When you're talking about uh, half-brothers, half sisters, family no matter what. Thank you, thank you. There's that, just your same DNA, half-brother or half-sister, the DNA still flows through. You have blood in common. We like to view each other as we're all brothers and sisters, right? And especially in a Christian environment that, uh, you know, we use the term brother and sister so, so frequently because we are one in Christ, you know, and, and that half-brother, half-sister thing, Sometimes, you know, it can, it can create problems in family dynamics, so, uh, but we saw that. In addition to interpreting the dream, seven years of abundance followed by seven years of famine, he suggested a plan to overcome, and we know the story, right, that uh, Joseph comes up with the plan on how Pharaoh can uh, overcome these years of famine by simply gathering extra grain during the years of plenty so that they would have plenty in store during the years of famine. Pharaoh promoted him to first minister and married him to Asenath. They had two children, Manasseh and Ephraim. Now, <clears throat> it's interesting to note because now this is now, Joseph, when he was sold into slavery, was about 17 years old. Now he's coming into a position of prominence after all those years of working with Potiphar, all those years of being in prison, now he's exalted and Pharaoh names him second in command of the entire kingdom places on him a nice gold necklace, right? And promotes him so that gives him his signet, gives him everything that Joseph would need. Then all of a sudden the, the drought, the famine hits the, the land of Canaan where his father and his brothers um, are staying. Joseph had to face his past during the first year of famine. His brothers came to him. The circumstances were entirely different to the last time they had met. So now Joseph is the one that's in charge of selling the grain to all these neighboring nations that are coming to buy grain from Joseph. And Joseph immediately sees his brothers, and he immediately recognizes them. Why do you think the brothers don't recognize Joseph? I see several hands. Uh, Diane, you want to give a... We have a mic for... Blue mic, please. First of all, even if they saw the resemblance, they may have dis dismissed it because they did not expect to see him in such an exalted position. He was also dressed like, you know, the Egyptian, and he spoke their language. So I think a large part of it is the expectation. You know, this can't be, they sold him into slavery. They did not, you know, expect or have the vision to think that this is what would have become of him. Yes. And what would be the physical appearance difference between an Egyptian and a Hebrew? Mm. Think about it. Physical difference. The attire, right? The, the dress. Obviously, he's wearing a gold chain. He's, in, he's a roid in his royal robes. What else physically about his appearance would be different? Shaved their head and no beard, right? So now Joseph, now is Joseph a good looking person or not? Very handsome and he was sold into slavery. So my guess is he's probably, 
he's got some good shape to him, and I think that's why he caught part of, part of his wife's attention, right? Uh, Elder Carl, yes. Yeah. Yeah, just make sure the mic's on so we can hear you. <laughs> well, Carl just said that also that when the brothers came to buy grain, they bowed themselves before Joseph. And what comes to Joseph's mind when he sees his brothers bowing before him? The dream, the dream right? He remembers the dream that, that, they, that they so were so angry with him about, but yet here it is, God fulfilling the prophecy that they would be bowing before him. Now, he's clean-shaven now, and he's, you know, he's from 17 to now, it's about, he's probably in his 30s at this point. He looks a lot different, you know, very, very much different. So they, they, they don't recognize him, but he immediately recognizes them because, again, their, their appearance probably hasn't changed all that much because they still, he could tell that they're Hebrew. He could tell that they're from the land of Canaan uh, because of their dress and because of their beards and because of the way they would typically look. But he looks on his brothers, and he notices one is missing. Who's missing? Benjamin. All, are, all are there except for Benjamin. So what instantly goes through Joseph's mind when he doesn't see Benjamin? The same thing. Someone with a mic. Go ahead, uh, Dr. Mangela. So he, he thought probably they killed him or did something bad to him that he doesn't exist anymore. Now, why would Joseph think that something bad would befall Benjamin again? Why Benjamin? Because, again, he is his brother, Rachel's uh, son, again. He Jacob. would have been the next in line to receive the inheritance because now Jacob fav would now be favoring Benjamin because now he's the youngest and he's, again, the only son of Rachel whom Jacob, the Bible says, loved. Jacob loved. Yeah. When you talk about love in the Bible, that, that working seven years and then an additional seven years just to, mm -hmm. just to get her hand in marriage, that's love. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm telling you, that's love. When the Bible says that Jacob loved um, Rachel, he loved her. He really did. He really did. And David, that's, that's how I it have, I have yes. a question. Yes. Um, so this is not from this slide, from the previous slide. Joseph was given in marriage to Asnath. Asnath is an Egyptian woman, right? Mm -hmm. How do you explain Joseph was very true to God and faithful? How did he accept an unequally yoked person as a wife? I know God had plans for him so that the Egyptian uh, woman and her whole family and, and relatives might have come to God. But how did Joseph, he was very faithful to God, yet he accepted Asnath as his wife. Can you explain what was? That's a prime example of, and the Bible talks about with regards to men taking many women as wives, right? I'll use that as an example. It was not God's plan that man should have more than one wife. The Bible says that in ignorance, God winks at it. He blesses despite that because of the cultural um, norms, right? That was a cultural norm. He now became an Egyptian. He was second in command in Egyptian, so he had to take, and I imagine Aseneth was in a royal line somewhere, so that marriage union was always uh, used as a means of strengthening uh, you know, national ties, right? So they, they would oftentimes enter into treaties by marriage. If one nation was going to be um, a uh, kind of a, um, what's the word? If they were going to be friendly nations, right, then they would marry each other's sons and wives so that they would have that, that bond and that communion. So it said she was the daughter of a priest on, what is that? Yeah, and that, that's the thing, because it's a royal line, because now they, th th that Egyptian, you know, and, and it's interesting because as you read on, Joseph was in fact embalmed and placed in a sarcophagus, just like the Egyptians. Whereas when Jacob, right, Jacob, at the end of the story, he goes into Egypt, what did he tell his son? What was his last dying wish? Take my bones. Take my bones back to the land of Canaan. I want to be buried in the cave with my fathers, do not let me be buried in Egypt. Yes. So we see there's a cultural difference, and it's all cultural, mostly, but God blesses despite it. And we see that throughout, when you, when you look at this, the, the bloodline of Jesus found in Matthew and in Luke, there's some Canaanites mixed in, right? There's, so there's, there's not, the, it, Jesus' blood was not a pure blood. It was a lot of outside foreign influences. So 
God blesses despite it. And I think that's what, um, following the bloodline of Jesus, Jesus inherited every sinful nature that man can possess because of his bloodline. And that's, I think, God's design, was that Jesus was going to come to this world with all the faults and frailties that men possess, and God was going to use that. So I, I hope that answers your question. Any other questions, comments? Yes. It's, uh, in addition to that, it is uh, no matter what Joseph, he, he was in the second in command, but uh, Sister White, she wrote, he did not forget God. He did not? He did not forget God, because all the time he was holding on, cling to God, and uh, is following the principles. Mm -hmm. Of God. Yeah. And, and it was Joseph's training as a young lad that saw him through Egypt. Can you imagine being in Egypt? I, and I use the example of Daniel in Babylon, the same thing. Mm -hmm. It was his training as a youth that helped him get through Babylon. So it was Joseph's training as a youth that helped him get through Egypt. He was in that world, but not of it. He followed the, the traditions. He had to shave his beard. He obviously did what he had to do in order to fit and blend in, you know. Uh, Paul said, I became all things to all people. And I think oftentimes when we see that, Joseph is an example of being in Egypt, okay, one of the most pagan nations that, that existed at the time, but yet still staying true to his beliefs and his uh, morals. But yet he still, as in marrying that wife, you know, um, had to kind of embrace the cultural norms. It was a cultural norm to do that. So uh, did you have a comment as well? I mean, uh, we can... We can only um, try to ascertain uh, who the character of the woman that Joseph might have chosen um, based on who Joseph was. Mm -hmm. uh, throughout, you know, for example, we have Ruth, who, and it's a little bit of a leap, but Ruth, who became part of the line of Jesus, right? Because Ruth eventually was married to Boaz. And, Boa, and they became the parents of Obed and Obed of Jesse and Jesse of David and then down through it. In part, Ruth may not want to go, go back to her family because she fell in love with the God of Naomi. Maybe that was the case of Joseph's wife, that she fell in love with Joseph's God and so that even though she was an Egyptian by culture, she had a love for God. There are going to be people who even they don't know there's something that draws them to the God of the universe and they live up to all the light that they, that they have even though it's dim, even though it's very dim for them. She may have been such a one. Yeah, and I think, and God will, God can bless and that's the thing. God has an ideal, okay, what the, what the you know, the union is one man, one woman, that's God's ideal. Now, is there divorce? Yes. Is there single parent homes? Yes. God blesses, right? The ideal is, God's ideal is this is what he would like ideally. But, you know, because of the world we live in and because of the, our culture and because of, you know, the different things that affect our family relationships, God still blesses. And he blesses in a, in a way because he's such a loving, merciful God. And I think that's, that's part and parcel to who he is. Okay, so Joseph sees his brothers and he could have chosen to punish them right then and there. He could have had them taken away and killed for doing what he did to them. But he uses this scheme, this plot, to try to find out what's happened to Benjamin. Have they also killed my young brother Benjamin? What about my father? So he, he starts to do this. He, he, being, he was a very wise person. The Bible describes him as very smart, intelligent. He could speak many languages. We said he was good looking, he was strapping, he probably was in uh, very good health, and um, he, he, he did a lot of things. So throughout the week, Sunday is entitled Facing the Past, Monday's Lessons, Setting the Stage, Tuesday, Forgive and Forget, Wednesday, Making it Practical, Thursday, Finding Rest After Forgiveness. We're going to go through this week, um, and time is fleeting, I'm seeing them. Sunday, Facing the Past. We are all one man's sons. We are honest men. Your servants are not spies. So Joseph accuses them of being spies. And this is how he gets the information out of them. No, we're, tw we're 12. One is no longer, and one is back with our father. We're all, we're all related. So how could we be spies? We're not, we're not 12 brother spies. So Joseph uses this as an opportunity to try to see if his brothers have changed. They were not spies. However, Joseph remembered they were jealous envious, murderers, 
and fratricides. You know, they tried to kill their own brother. Now, when they were, um, Joseph sees his brothers out in the field and he comes in and he's wearing his bright, shiny coat of many colors, you know, probably I, I picture him floating in the breeze, you know, being, being all, uh, you know, I've seen many movies, characterization of Joseph with that coat coming out to see his brothers and they, it just in, fills them with rage. Now, how many of the brothers wanted to kill him? Most of them wanted to kill him. Who did not want, want to kill him? Who was the one that defended him the most? Reuben, Reuben. Reuben was, what, where, where was he in position of the brothers? He was the eldest, right? The sister. Well, he, he, he. Go ahead, Pastor. Yeah, he was first born like Joseph was first born. Yes. And they were the closest in family because their mothers were sisters. Yes. Now, when, in fact, they wanted to kill him, what was Reuben's idea to do with Joseph? Put him in the pit with the intention of what? Rescuing him and bringing him back to his father. That was Reuben, who was the eldest, and he implored his brothers not to do this. Now the brothers throw him in the pit, then they sell him to slavery. When Reuben finds out that they sold him, what, what was Reuben's reaction? He was devastated. He was upset with his brothers that they did this to, his, to their own brother. So he was the only one. I'll get I was going to ask a question, but I'm going to save it for as we get more further. So they treated Benjamin the same way they treated him. Were they taking care of their old father? Caring for the weak and defenseless was one of the biblical principles Joseph had embraced. Abuse within the family is one of the most serious because it is usually kept quiet. No physical, sexual, or emotional abuse can be tolerated. Now, it's a very sensitive topic, yes. And even within the Christian homes and even within the Bible, have we seen... Bible texts twisted and converted that oftentimes leads families, men in particular, because the largest percentage of abusers are men, to twist the Bible text and think that, they, that, a, that a wife or a woman is a piece of property that they can do with whatever they want. Under no circumstances is that tolerable by any biblical definition, okay? God does not like violence of any sort, of any shape, form, or fashion. For many years, it's been tolerated throughout Christian denominations, not just our own, but all Christian denominations, where the guise of Christianity is used as a cover to allow these abuses to take. And under no circumstances, we as a church community and the pastor and the elders were here for the, any types of those situations. So if you are in that situation, please reach out for help because that is not to be tolerated in this day and age under any circumstances, just putting that out there as well. Fortunately, his father and his brother were fine. The situation had changed. Monday, setting the stage. Yes, Pastor. Uh, I have a comment here. Joseph's story was God's perfect plan to bless the nation of Israel. Joseph's story was God's perfect plan to bless the nation of Israel. Yes, yes, it definitely was. So as Joseph accuses them of being spies, they start talking openly in front of Joseph, but Joseph can understand what they're saying. Then they said to one another, we are truly guilty concerning our brother, for we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us, and we would not hear. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. Joseph had already forgiven his brothers. His story would have been hugely different if he had chosen hate and resentment instead. Again, if he was harboring those ill feelings all those years of being sold into slavery and being put into prison, he should have killed his brothers right there on the spot. But he had already made it up in his mind that he had forgiven them. So that the, when they had come before him like that, there was no anger or resentment in him to be found. It was, it was, it was completely wiped clean. He didn't remember what they, he, not, that he did, not that he forgot, but he chose not to dwell upon it. So he puts this elaborate, um, were the brothers in fact really changed? Yes, Sister White says that they, those years with, his, with their father, they were very um, uh, stubborn brothers. They were, they were violent, they were wicked, they were cruel. But in the years that they spent with their father while Joseph was away, they actually became much more softened. They regret, regretted what they did to their brother. And they, in fact, you know, they, they, the Bible talks about this fear of judgment. 
they knew that eventually that sin was going to be visited upon them. And I think it was that constant worry, when is God going to repay us for what we did to our brother? Can you imagine living life like that? All those years with your father, just waiting for the shoe to drop, so to speak. They knew in their heart of hearts, because every time, and here it is, we are truly guilty concerning our brother, for we saw the anguish of his soul. So they realized that guilt is, that they're walking around with this guilt for all these years of what they did with their brother. Yes. That's, that's a little concerning to me, however, because they never confessed. Mm. To, they never, they were carrying it around, at least the Bible doesn't document that they ever confessed to their father and confessed to God for what they had done to their brother. Y yeah. Uh, no, I said the Bible doesn't say. We see them confessing to one another. Correct. Right? And, but then when you follow the story, they at were the lying end, to their dad. after Joseph reveals himself to his brothers, he says, he says, go to my father and bring him to the land, to the land of Egypt. Then it was then that they confessed to their father what they had done to Joseph. So it was at that point, because they, again, that's the part of sin and guilt that is so devastating because they carried this burden and this guilt all these years of what they had done to their brother, and they kept it from their father for all those many years. But yet, you know, I think it was that burden and that guilt that, you know, made them change their, their ways in, in terms of not being so so wicked the way they were. Call, yes, and then yeah, the pastor. Um, I don't think they ever really got over it because even when they were living in Egypt with Joseph and Joseph, you know, said he forgave them or he did forgive them, but they didn't quite accept his forgiveness uh, because after their father died, then they thought, okay, this is when the hammer's gonna hit, yes. you know? Yeah. Uh, and Joseph had to again reassure them that he had no malice toward them, that he would not take any revenge at all. So it took, so they, they lived with this guilt, not just when Joseph left, but all those years, even when they were living with Joseph in Egypt, uh, you know, uh, safe and eating and having everything they needed, they still did not quite uh, feel forgiven. <laughs> right, right, and that's what the Bible describes as a fearful expectation. Right? A fearful expectation. This is what sin does to the human body. It's this fearful expectation because you're exactly that. You're waiting for the shoe to drop. When is my sin going to find me out? Right? Yes, Pastor. Yeah, because even after uh, uh, Jacob died, the brothers were afraid that Joseph would then kill him, that mm -hmm. he wouldn't kill him while the father was alive, but once he died. And, and the other thing is, is um, I just wonder, when we confess to God, do we always need to tell others the sin that has been done against them are some things better that we take it to god and leave it now Ellen white talks about public sins need to be publicly private sins need to be privately and, and and it just seems that maybe this was the case what benefit would it have been to tell jacob that they had killed their brother hmm. Would it, uh, would it pushed him over the edge would it hmm. and maybe that was their fear of not only have we done this against our brother Maybe they did make it right with God, confessed to God, and then still expected retribution because that's how they believed at the time. Right. But would it have done any good? And once Joseph was alive, then they confessed because Joseph is alive and now I can take my father and it, it's not going to lead him to have a heart attack because they saw what jo Jacob did when they found out he was dead. Right. And the struggle that he had with saying, now you take Benjamin from me. Now you're taking Simeon. Now you're taking all my children. Yeah, and... Sin. We have vertical sins that are directly against God, which we might describe as the first four commandments, right? We have horizontal sins, which might be described as the last six commandments that are against our brother. Ultimately, all sin is against who? God. God, right? So where should we confess our sins? Okay. To God directly. Now, that doesn't mean that, in fact, that we shouldn't, because the Bible talks about confess your faults one to another, right? If I have wrought against a brother, I go to that brother directly, Matthew 18, right? The, the biblical advice is to go to that person, you and that person alone, and, and if you have wrought against someone, not to the church, not to the rumor mill, not to the stabbing behind the back type of deal, you go to the person directly and confess, confess that, that, that ought that you have against a, against a brother or a sister, and, and that's biblical advice. If that was done, there'd be so few problems in the church because so oftentimes we go to gossip and to talk bad about the person 
having never gone to the person themselves and, and discussing it, when meanwhile it was something that was probably very trivial that the person didn't even realize that they did, and yet it creates all this firestorm, and the devil just, oh boy, does he take that and run with it. You know, it's, it's definitely that. Uh, yes, Angela and then Diana can. <coughs> Sorry. Could it be the consequence of sin uh, also? Because when Jacob sinned, he, um, uh, he wrongfully sinned against his brother, right, Esau. So he prayed to God and God forgave him of the sin. Yet he had to face the consequence of his trickery because he was tricked in his life. So these brothers, they, they sinned against God, they sinned against Joseph, but even if they had uh, asked God to forgive them, that the consequence of their sin probably was that guilt that even though they asked God to forgive them, they carried that guilt throughout their life. Yeah, like you yeah, said, I mean, after Jacob died also, they, they were fearful of that consequence. Probably. They, they sinned against their brother, they sinned against their father, and they ultimately sinned against God. You know, they, they lied to their father, they, they sold their brother into slavery, and uh, yes, Diane, and then the pastor. Some some, um, God sees sin all the same, right? But some of our sins are one-stop shopping and some of our sins are perpetual. So if I steal a piece of chicken off of your plate, that's tomorrow or if you get another piece of chicken, you may have forgotten about that piece of chicken and I don't have to keep on lying about the piece of chicken that I stole off of your plate. Sorry, your piece of veggie meat. But if I was going to say soy chicken, but you yeah, you but if it's chicken. but if it's the, the the son that I killed, right? I killed your son. Every time Joseph's name comes up in the family, and the father says my son is dead, and nobody admits to the fact that they sold him. To me, that's the lie being perpetuated every single day. So. Also, the servant of the Lord, she speaks about, she talks in, in the book, I don't remember which specific book, but in the book Bible Answers, which is a compilation of her, you know, answering different theological questions and doctrinal questions. She talks about confessing to each other and confessing to God. You're not, you don't have to go to a third party and confess, somebody who has no relationship to the sin, unless it's a public sin, of course, but you confess, confess to the person against whom you sin, I guess in this case we could say it was Joseph, but they were lying to the father and every time Joseph's name came up and the father was mourning or weeping about his son or lamenting that he's lost a son, that was a lie over and over again. So the question, I mean, because they could have said he's not dead. They, that may have relieved him. He's not dead, he's a slave. I don't know and, the answer. I, I think that was that's part of different. the anguish that they had to suffer because when, when Jacob learned that his son was dead, he could not be consoled. He could not be consoled. He was in such deep anguish. Can you imagine the sons having to see their father that way in his old age and, and lamenting the loss of his son for so many years and you having to sit there and live with that guilt that you lied to your father? You know, and we're talking about this is patriarchal times. This is not like our culture today where they actually have respect, respect for, their, for their fathers and their mothers. It, it's, it, it boggles the mind. Pastor, did you have a comment question? Okay. I'm running behind. His brothers did not know that Joseph could understand their language, so they spoke openly and showed their remorse. 21 years of remorse. Imagine living with that for 21 years. Joseph was convinced that to some other tests he showed favoritism towards Benjamin, but his brothers did not show jealousy or envy, but protected Jen Benjamin, which he was happy to, to lean. Forgive and forget. This is where we as Christians oftentimes get it so wrong. I forgive you, but I will never forget what you did to me. This is what we say. Right? And that's not true forgiveness. Because what does the Bible say with regards to forgiveness? Okay? Be ye kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as, which means in the same manner, as God in Christ forgave you. How did God in Christ forgive you? He says, Take heed to yourself. Well, it says here, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and I will not remember your sins. God says I will cast them into the depths of the ocean. I will not remember them. Now, does God get amnesia? He's choosing not to remember, okay, because he's God. He's saying I will not remember your sins because I've, it, he's taking, swearing by himself as if it was possible that he would not remember 
your sins. But yet we choose to say, this is our idea of forgiveness. Oh, well, I forgive you, but I'll never forget what you did to me. Um, our idea of forgiveness is that, um, oh, it, or, or sometimes when we ask for an apology, we say, oh, well, if, if I did something to offend you, I'm sorry. If I did something to offend you, I'm sorry. That's not biblical forgiveness. That's not biblical confession, right? You, you have to apologize for what you've done if you've known you've done something wrong to someone. And then the, the biblical idea of forgiveness is not that we're going to get amnesia because our brains are our brains, right? But we're choosing not to dwell upon it, you know? I, Pastor Doug always says that, you know, you can't stop the birds from flying over your head, but you can choose to stop them from making a nest on the top of your head, right? So you're choosing not to dwell upon the sins that someone has done to you. You're choosing to... Forgive, forgive it, forget it, and move on, right? That's biblical forgiveness. Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him up to seven times. Peter thought that he was being generous because it was only a biblical definition of three or four times that you needed to forgive someone. He says, oh, well, I'll go to the perfect number seven. And what does Jesus answer? And we know that there's a spiritual significance, right? Not till seven times, but 70 times seven, which equals what? 490, which equals what? Yes, God suffered long and hard with the nation of Israel for 490 years, and he used that as a biblical example of how long his forgiveness endured for. So what if Joseph's brothers had not repented or changed at all? Should he have forgiven them? Genuine forgiveness involves forgiving others even if they do not deserve it. God's forgiving love is unconditional even when we do not deserve it. We forgive because God has forgiven us. When we forgive others, our bitterness goes away, the past is left behind, and we can go on with love and acceptance. So if your brother sins against you, what's the biblical advice? Luke 17, 3 and 4, and I use this in my sermon. Take heed to yourselves if your brother... because uh, Matthew writes it that way, but Luke writes it differently. He says, take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you, saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Okay? So what does that word rebuke mean? Beat him over the head with a baseball bat? You go to the person, just like Matthew 18 says, you go to the person one-on-one, -on -one, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so. Remember that day when you said or did this? I was deeply offended by that, or you really hurt my feelings, or something like that. So that's what the biblical definition is rebuke. You go and you speak to the person. It's very simple, but yet it's very difficult to follow when, when, when we... When we tried with that. Yes, Pastor. Yeah, we have a comment here online um, from Sister Walters. She says, how do we as humans forget the action that we say we forgive to achieve complete forgiveness? It's hard. So in other words, we say we forgive them, but how do we forget? And, uh, um, well. What? It's impossible. You hear what I said? It's impossible. But what does the Bible say with, with regards God. to what's impossible? With, with God. God, all things are possible, okay? Confess it. You can, you read through the Psalms. David calls out God on many things, the anguish of his soul and the, the things that he was tormented with, and he cries out to God in those Psalms, and he pours out his spirit to God. That's what you should be doing. Pour it out to God and release it. Release it. And then pray for God to fill it up with, with, with something else, you know? And you'll be surprised how God will take it away from you, you know? Not forgiving, as someone said, is like drinking poison and hoping that the other person dies, right? That's what you're doing by having an unforgiving spirit. And it's pretty clear in the Bible, in 2 Corinthians 2.10, uh, Paul writes it this way, now, when, now whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ, lest... Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So that unforgiving spirit is a product of Satan. It's purely satanic, okay? So do not allow the devil to have a foothold on your brain and upon your soul, okay? Because if you have an unforgiving spirit, it is of the devil. An unforgiving spirit, okay, Sister White also says in um, Christ Object Lessons, 
we are not forgiven because we forgive, but as we forgive. You catch that? We are not forgiven because we forgive, but as we forgive. It's something that is, comes from God. That forgiven spirit, it's God-given because God forgives us. Think of all the sins that we've committed against God, and he, he's, he's um, you know, forgiven us so openly. He's such a wonderful, marvelous God, and the Spirit of God is able to accomplish this in us if we, if we surrender that. I didn't make it through the lesson. I'm seeing I'm running out of time. I'm so sorry. Um, I had so much more to cover. I didn't realize it was going to be so profound. But um, uh, forgiveness has been defined as the willingness to abandon one's right to resentment, condemnation, and revenge toward an offender or group who acts unjustly. Forgiveness, like love, begins with a choice rather than a feeling. Forgiveness, like love, begins with a choice rather than a feeling. You can't wait for that feeling of forgiveness. You have to choose to forgive. Mm -hmm. God bless you. Continue to study. So sorry we didn't get to cover everything. Uh, next week's lesson's entitled Free to Rest. Free to Rest. God bless. Thank you, Elder. That was good. Uh, could use another hour on that one, huh? So uh, maybe we should talk about starting at 930. Yeah. 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 Amen. Amen. Yeah. yeah. So that means you got to get up earlier, right? Yeah. Amen. 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 You're already up, right? You're already up at home just waiting to get here. Like, I wish they'd start at 930. So, uh, yeah, well, let's pray about that, see what happens. But anyway, thank you online for uh, tuning in and being here. It's up to the teachers, too. They got to commit to that, that they get that extra uh, uh, 30 minutes in there. But uh, anyway, uh, again, thank you for tuning in. We'll have a short break and be back here at 11 o'clock. Let's close with a prayer. Father, we thank you for the Sabbath. We thank you for this amazing uh, uh, lesson that we are able to study and spend time on. Pray that you will continue to bless and guide as we learn more about you. Help us to be as Joseph, who was a reflection of who you are. So we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless. Happy Sabbath.